heart murmur, uh, but I never realized, I don't know if anybody else did or whatever, but he was setting up for Awana in the building and passed away in our church building. All of a sudden, the next Sunday, I get a call from, from Bob Cassidy saying, we need you to come and, I said, who are you, you know, it's been months, you know, and uh, I said, well, I'm going to another church to, can, to, to preach uh, in two weeks, he said, oh, we got to get you before them, you know, so it was like that week I had to come down, so that was my first sermon here, and then, uh, let's see, on the 20th of January, I preached the same passage, a little slightly different sermon, that I passed, we started John 1, John 1, 1 to 14, I preached that on uh, January 20th. Then on Jan uh, let's see, January 8th, that was a little before that, was my candidating sermon, that was Ephesians 4, I preach that anytime I go to candidate, it talks about us being ministers, you know, like some call us pastors and, uh, and teachers for the work of the service that we might train others. And then uh, Valentine's weekend, we moved here. And that was, and my first sermon here as pastor was 30 years ago this week. So we started a, it was actually a February 17th. Go to that other uh, slideshow if you want. So today is actually our 30th anniversary of the church. It was kind of special for us. Um, we'll take a trip, quick trip back because I don't want to take too much time on this. Go to the next slide if you would. And this is Lois and I. 30 years ago with our baby one and a half year old Caleb uh, standing at the stairwell going up into the parsonage. If any of you remember the old parsonage, you probably remember that wallpaper, <laughs> okay? And then uh, the next one, uh, there's our Caleb. All of you that remember he's now six foot five, okay? I, how many people were here 30 years ago? Raise your hands. Okay, I got three, okay, that remember back in there. Uh, so you really, you don't really like Caleb, but uh, that's actually my father, my father standing, sitting in the background there. And then the next picture is a picture of our three children at the time, or actually, no, two children. This is Jonathan and, and big sister Carissa, I guess, I don't know where, they're sitting at a table someplace eating, and that was the same time, there are January, February 1989 slides. And I had to scan these so they don't come out quite as well. Then the next slide is um, our family photos, the three kids, that was probably Easter, our first year here, and that is not you. <laughs> you're, that, you're that little baby all the way over on the left of the top. That was, a, that was probably 1991 because Jamie's probably about a year old there. And the one on the right was the one actually with the, two, with the three children. So, um, yeah, you were a real baby over on the left. <laughs> and then, uh, so that's Chris and Jonathan. You both know them. and You all know them. And then the next picture. I really want to do this because I want to thank Marty for being my secretary for 30 years. Oh, uh, Marty, come on up if you will. I don't. I don't know if you. I don't know if you know the story. I showed up that first week, and she said, "Pastor, I'll um, I'll help you with the bulletin for a couple of weeks." And we had one of those copiers. It was about this size, but this size. I had the, the glass on top that you know it would do. You know, like ten ten a minute. You know, you'd you'd go the plat of glass would move on the back side of it and so forth to come back. Had those, and um, that was an ominous thing for her to say because thirty years later she's still secretary. So uh, even though she had a stroke last year and Mar got as marvelously brought her back, uh, she's still doing stuff. No gray hair there. <laughs> come on over here, Marty. So I got a, just a, a little significant appreciation. It says. Uh, it says, thank you to Marty Salzman and appreciation for 30 years of service as my church secretary. Thank you. So come on over here, Marty. Let's get it. Come on up here. Uh, come close. Let's get a picture here. I think you turn one sideways and come up closer so we can get turned sideways and come on closer so we can get really, really a nice one. We'll remember this day. So thank you, Marty. Don't volunteer to do Boltons for anybody else. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. So that's basically our introduction to today's sermon because today we're back in John and we're on John chapter three this morning in the very beginning. So we're going to keep on going through the book of John. And this is a, this is a, a very, uh, it's a great book. There. In the book of John, he gives, uh, Jesus gives interviews with 11 different people, Okay. This is one of them, and probably one of the most important ones as we look at this particular section of Scripture. There's a few things I want to talk to you about. Uh, Nicodemus is the man, and I want to talk to give you a few things that we notice in verse 1 right here off the bat with uh, Nicodemus that I just want to mention. First of all, uh, as, we, as we look here at this section, uh, this verse, first verse says, but, it says, but, uh, 
or now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He's contrasting him, if you remember, Pastor Rob last week talked about in verses 33 through 35 of this chapter two, it says, now when he was in Jerusalem, all the Passover, um, at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, beholding his signs, which he was doing, but Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting, and actually was the same word, believing, was not believing in them, or trusting himself to them, for he knows he knew all men, and because he did not any, need anyone to bear witness of himself, um, because he knew what was in man. Now, or but, Nicodemus. So Nicodemus was a different kind of person. John wants to point out that Nicodemus is coming to me after this Passover, a little different, different attitude, and we're going to look through it as we go through here. A second thing is his name means conqueror. Uh, or victor of the people. I think, the, uh, there, did I put a slide in there previous to this? There we go. Um, uh, about him, uh, that was his name. His pedigree was that he was a Pharisee. You often heard the Pharisees uh, giving Jesus problems and, and tough times. They were legalists, okay? And the Pharisees were probably the legalistic Baptists we have today, you know, that add a lot of different things to it. You know, I mean, you gotta use the King James version. You gotta, you know, can't, all the ladies have to wear, uh, you know, dresses. I mean, they got, they got a lot of legalistic rules that you won't find anything in scripture about per se. And that's what the Pharisees were. And then um, he uh, came with them at night. Um, and we don't know why. It doesn't say in the text. Possibly came, be, uh, some suggest, because he wanted privacy. You know, Jesus was busy during the day. He was busy with affairs and doing stuff. And so he came to the night when he had more time. But most people, and I think probably so, he came at night because he feared the other Pharisees and the people. Um, what had happened, if you remember, what did pre um, Pastor Rob preach about last week? What was Jesus doing? Anybody remember Pastor Rob's sermon last week, the end of chapter two? <laughs> Where was he? Uh, yes, he was at the temple, remember? He cleansed the temple. He threw all the money changers out and everything. So he had just made a big ruckus. His, like his, his first introduction was going into the temple and cleansing the temple, throwing out the money changers, turning it off. I mean, it was a mess in there. This is the temple, and here we have Nicodemus, who's one of the Pharisees and probably one of the Sanhedrin, the 70 men that ruled this area, era, area, and they were not too happy with what Jesus just did in the temple. And so I think he probably said, you know what? Uh, let me go to this guy at night and find what's really going on, because it was different than the rest. And so he comes to him by night. Now, just before we go on to read this section, let me just give you a couple of ex examples here of the Pharisees who had uh, established a religion of legalism. Here are some of the things that they, here are three, just three items. A woman could not look into a mirror on the Sabbath because she might see a gray hair and be tempted to pull it out, and that would be working on the Sabbath. This is the laws that the Pharisees put into place, you know, over and above what the scriptures say. A uh, second one. One was allowed to swallow vinegar on the Sabbath as a remedy for a sore throat, but they could not use it to gargle. Third rule. An egg laid on the Sabbath could be eaten provided one intended to kill the hen that laid the egg. Okay? They have all these, all these rules that they go back and they add all these little things to it. That was the type of legalist that the, the Pharisees had become. They were actually better than the Sadducees. They were the ones that believed the scripture. They believed in the resurrection. They had, it was great, but they'd gone way too far beyond scripture. And Nicodemus was one of those. So as we go through the book of John, you hear about the Pharisees and so forth, you'll see some of these things coming out. Let's all stand and read through um, this passage of scripture this morning, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, and then we'll take uh, together um, look at this passage briefly. Uh, and I'm going to see, let's see, we got a, we got a pretty good size here. Let's look at this, odd verses, even verses, and we'll all read the last one, verse 13, together, okay? So you start the odd oversight here with me. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? 
Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I build you earthly things, and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And then together, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. You may be seated. Take your Bibles, if you will, and uh, follow along with me today as we look at this particular passage. Um, of all the interviews Jesus Christ did, this is one of the most important ones. Next week, we'll be going into verses uh, 14 through 21, and Pastor Ed will have those, and we'll be looking at uh, a very familiar, familiar verse as part of that whole section, which is John 3, 16. John 3, 16 came about because of this discussion with Nicodemus and the questions he had. And as you look through this section with Nicodemus, you'll find that there were three um, questions or comments that Nicodemus makes. And each one of those, Jesus replies to, and in Jesus' reply, he uses this phrase, truly, truly, or in the old, the old uh, version, verily, verily, he used that verse to kind of uh, highlight what he was saying. So let's look at the three exchanges that come between these two men. If you have your uh, notes and your uh, bulletin there, you can pull them out, and we'll just go over them. And I don't have a whole lot of detail in those notes except what took place. And if there's anything else that we say that you think is important, that you can, you can kind of write it down on the space on the reverse side here. First of all, the first exchange begins in, in uh, verse 2 of, of this particular section. And we just, it says, And this man came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So some suggest this could be a statement of flattery. Oh, you're really, you know, you must be from God uh, because a lot of the Pharisees didn't believe. But I don't believe so because it says, Now Nicodemus in verse 1 came placing him different from the other folks in verses 23 to 25 of the previous chapter. This man, I think, had a real heart to find God. And he's saying, you know what? I've seen all these miracles. I've seen what you did. You just went and cleansed the temple, which I probably wasn't too happy about. But uh, where's all this stuff coming from? He says, I know you're a teacher, and you have to come from God because these signs, nobody else could do these kinds of signs. And um, it's, uh, John kind of highlights, if you remember going back to the end of chapter uh, of John, chapter 20, verse 31, it says, these signs I've written that you might believe in the name of the Son of God. So he's picking out signs, picking out discussions. It's actually discourses. You'll find two things in John. You'll find signs or miracles, and you'll find discourses or discussions that John brings out particularly so that we can understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you don't believe that today or don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, uh, today's the day to listen to this passage and get, make sure that you know you're going to heaven because that's where Nicodemus was. So Nicodemus comes to him, and he, um, he makes a statement. You come from God as a teacher because of these signs. So John is trying to show in this discourse with him, he's included this one um, because he thinks it's going to help us understand that Jesus is the Son of God. By the way, Nicodemus is not mentioned in any of the other three Gospels. John is the only one that records this. And he, he was one of the early disciples, so he's probably watching this actually take place. And he's hearing what's going on, and that's why he's recording to it because it's so important to him. The Jesus response doesn't even wait for a question. I mean, Nicodemus didn't kind of ask him a question here, did he? He just made a statement, you know? I can tell you from the Son of God, you're the Son of God because of the signs, you know, you're a good teacher. And Jesus jumps right in with something he wants to tell Nicodemus. He had the advantage also of being omniscient, and he knew what was in his heart, and this is the statement he makes. Unless you are born again, you can't see heaven, basically. And that comes to us in verse 3. 
Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the, and he says, kingdom of God. These are the only two places the kingdom of God is used in John. But in essence, he's referring to heaven. You must be born again. This is the starting point of many questions with unbelievers. You know, how do I get to heaven? What's it take? This is the basic question that comes to the people. And Jesus Christ hits Nicodemus with it right out, flat out, right in the beginning. This makes a great impression on John. If you look back in 1 John 5, 11 through 13, he says, he who has the Son has the life, and he who does not have the Son of God does not have. It's black and white. It's right there. John puts it in his epistle, but here he records Jesus Christ saying it to him. Now, this born again, the word again could mean the word again, <clears throat> could be translated anew and it's probably used a good place a good number of places as from above so it could mean born from above born anew or born again so born from above i mean basically a lot of the same terms a little difference in the in the innuendos but uh, they all mean basically the same thing a second birth birth again birth anew or birth from above as different from the physical birth now nicodemus heard this kind of thing and he introduces this phrase um, of being born again. Uh, regeneration, we call it, okay? What's, what's a generation? When you generate something, or if a, if a woman generates a child, what is she doing? She's giving birth to a child, okay? And re is again. So regeneration is rebirth, born again. So regeneration and born again are the same words. So if you hear those words, they're kind of interchangeable in the scriptures. And regeneration is a verse, is a word you'll hear often in the scriptures and you should know as a believer in Jesus Christ. It said that George Whitfield, um, who preached both the United States and uh, what was, a, was a, a Brit, basically, in fact, he associated with um, Benjamin Franklin with the, and preached down where the University of Penn is and is partially responsible for that institution being in existence. It said, it said that he, he preached over 300 times on being born again in the city of London alone because it was such an important topic. Today, we need to realize what is born again. Now, we think born again became real popular back in the days of Chuck Colson, remember that? Uh, the Nixon affair and so forth. Chuck Colson was one of the ones that went to prison over that whole thing, got converted in prison, and he wrote a book called Born Again and became very popular, very well known back then. He's with the Lord now, but uh, got miraculously saved and actually is one of the good positive things that came out of the Nixon uh, era because it really affected Charles Colson's life and he came to the Lord and became one who would really follow him. That's the first exchange. The second exchange is, after he says this one word, is now Nicodemus has a question, okay? And let's go to the second, the second thing here, and it's in verse four. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Does that seem like a dumb question? You know, we have to give Nicodemus the benefit of the doubt. This guy is talking to Jesus at the very beginning of his ministry. He hasn't had any of the epistles, hasn't had any of the gospels, doesn't know that Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross, doesn't have a reflection of that. In fact, as we look back and as John looks back, he used this discussion to kind of set up the idea that Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross, as we'll find out next week from Pastor Ed when he talks about Moses and the serpent, okay? But Nicodemus doesn't have that. He's just totally bad. What does it mean born again? Now, born again was actually a term that was used in Jewish literature some, and so he should have had some familiarity with it because they dealt with different things. When a, when a, when a Greek or became a proselyte to become a Jew, they sometimes would use that terminology, born again, for them because they're born again. Now they're born into the, the Jewish faith. Uh, there are some other places, but it doesn't appear that he's a clue to what it means to be born again. And so as you look at this, he completely misses the point. He's thinking physical and earthly, not heavenly. He's not thinking of where things are going here. It doesn't, this statement doesn't apply he's old, but Nicodemus, in order to have this place of, of high priority uh, in the Jewish system, was very likely an older man. I've always thought of him being 70 years old, you know, but he may not be. Maybe 30, maybe 40, pro probably 50, you know, he's, he's, but he's, he's not a young kid, but it doesn't matter. How can a grown man 
get born again and go in his mother's womb. I, I, I just, he just, he's just not thinking. Jesus responds with four comments, and this is probably the longest, the second longest discourse he's going to detail here. So he follows with four comments, and they all, and he starts these four comments off again in verse 5 with, truly, truly, I say to you, verse 5, the first thing, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, born of the Spirit is regeneration, becoming a, becoming a child of God. What does it mean to be born of the water? Now, there's a number of different, um, so I say commentators have thought of different things that they think this is involved with. One thing they think it might be is it refers to the water of God. It talks about, in the scriptures, some place it talks about washing with the word, okay? The word cleanses you. Um, in, um, pretty soon we have uh, the woman at the well, if you remember, and that's in chapter four. And what does he offer her? Living water. So what is the living water? His word. So some think, oh, it's the word of God. That's what some people say the water means. Um, some think it means purification. Remember in chapter two, Jesus Christ had turned water into wine and he'd use those big, those big uh, jars. What were those jars normally full of? Water for purification, cleansing, that kind of stuff. So they're thinking, oh, the water means you gotta be cleansed or purified. I mean, that's what John was doing. He was, he was purifying the people getting ready for the Messiah to come. The third thing some people think it refers to is water baptism. You know, and so it means you have to be you have to be baptized and be by the water and by the Spirit. Um, the pro, there there are two problems with that. One is that while baptism is that baptism is not necessary for salvation. Now, mind you, it is mandatory to be an obedient believer. So if you've not been immersed, okay. I, I really have a hard time saying if I, if, that you're being an obedient believer if you really know the truth because the scripture says once you have the professed Jesus Christ with your mouth, now it's time to profess him in the waters of baptism, okay? But it is not necessary to go to heaven, okay? You can be disobedient or not growing or whatever it happens to be, whatever, however you want to look at it, but the, you don't need it for salvation. The thief on the cross, Jesus Christ said, you will be today with me, you will be with me in Paradise. Then have a chance to come down to the cross and be baptized, okay? One other commentator who takes water, water baptism to be there says, well, a lot of people were thinking water baptism was important, and John was baptizing, so it could make be easy to make that link that they're thinking about John who's out there baptizing the Jordan. But it's not only the baptism. You, it, the water is, a, is one part of it, but you also have to be baptized by the Spirit. have to have an inward heart change, okay? I don't like any of those three. I believe it talks about what it talks about water and the spirit. I think he's talking about physical birth, okay? I've seen five of my children born and surrounding the, the baby in the womb is, a, is a, a lot of water, okay? Amniotic sac, okay? I think that's the thing that he's referring to. Now, I also found just studying today uh, or this week in this uh, new um, that there's a lot of, um, there's a number of, way, of uh, words uh, water, rain, um, um, dew, uh, there was a couple other words too that were used, and those words in the Jewish context, in this context that we're talking about, referred to the male sperm, and water was attached there. Either way you want to look at it, I think the, I think the idea of the baby being born and, and raised in water is the idea. I think he's referring to physical birth, and it makes sense as we look at the rest of this text, because he seems to differentiate between water uh, between physical birth and spiritual birth, okay? So let's go on to this, the second thing that he says here, and if you look in verse, um, if you look in verse um, six, it says, he follows this up with not only is born of the water and spirit, you have to be one of both or you can't go to heaven. Secondly, he says in verse six, that which is born of the flesh is, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, why would Nicodemus think the flesh is important? All Jews had a pedigree. It went all the way back to Abraham. And they figured, since we're children of Abraham, we're good to go with God, right? And so they were looking at the flesh as being their, their connection to God. If you're born a Jew, you're fine. If you weren't born a Jew, then you had to somehow get into the Jewish system, you know, as a proselyte. But if you were a Jew, 
It was your birth that took care of that things. And some people today, frankly, think the same thing. Think, I was born into a Christian family, and they grow up, and they think, I don't have to worry about, you know, accepting Jesus Christ. And I was born in a Christian family. And yes, and when you come to Christ, and sometimes they say, well, I don't know, I just have always known Jesus. And that, and that may be true as we grow up, but we have to come to that place in our lives when we realize it's not that I was born into a Christian family that does me any good but it's that I personally have come to some point in my life, whether you can identify the moment or not, when I accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and I, or I recognized that he was my Savior and then hopefully proclaimed that in the waters of baptism. Because if you can't look back and say, this is the very moment I made a decision for Jesus, you can always look back and say, this was the moment I professed it before people and told them all, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I've been baptized. You can always look back to that date. So, at any rate, as we look at this particular passage, flesh is flesh. What are you saying? You can't evolve from a fleshly existence or a fleshly destiny to a heavenly destiny. Flesh stays flesh, spirit stays spirit. So you're not going to, as, as, as one commentator put it, he says you can't, there's no evolution from flesh to spirit. Nicodemus had to recognize that he might have been flesh, might have been Jewish, might have been a Pharisee, might have been a head of the Jewish system, but yet that didn't put him right with God because spirit is spirit. There are two different things, which adds another reason why I think that this particular text, when he looks back at water and the spirit, he's talking about physical birth and spiritual birth. That brings him on to the third thing that Jesus says here, and it's in verse 7. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. So he repeats what he said the first time a second time. Do you think that makes it important? Raise your hand if you're awake this morning. <laughs> if I repeat something twice, do you think I think it's important? If Jesus says it twice, do you think it's important? Yes. He's trying to emphasize Nicodemus, and he, but he adds a word. What's he say? must be born again. It's not an option, okay? It's not, there's, there's a lot of ways to heaven uh, and you can get there if you want to. It's a must. You must be born again. It is a requirement for entrance into heaven. People don't like that today. They say Christianity is an exclusive religion and I don't like that, you know? You have the Hindus, you know? Uh, you can be a practice, you know, you have a lot of different gods, and I'm not a big th expert on Hindus, but they have all kinds of gods, you know, and you, and you can easily take in and assimilate the Christian faith into all the others. And you look at Muslims, and I mean, you can go through all the, from Buddha, I mean, uh, Taoism, you can go through all the different religions of the world, okay? But the thing that offends others, and especially those in America, is that it's exclusive. America doesn't like things exclusive, and it's getting more and more that way, isn't it? Um, you know, they don't like to see differences between anything. Young and old, the same, doesn't matter. Men and women, the same, you know? Go, use whichever bathroom you feel like today, you know? The military, what are we doing? We're putting women all of a sudden now, equal rights, put them on the front lines, let them go into combat. I don't know where you stand on that kind of thing. There's a lot of different views. I have my personal view, having been in the military, and it's not, but when you look at that kind of thing, I think things might change in a few years. If we have another big war, they reinstitute the draft, and all of a sudden they start drafting both men and women into the military and say, every man and every woman at 18 years of age has to register, and we're gonna draft them because they're all the same. You've got the, the um, LGBT community saying, you know, we're just as good as the straights or the, the normal, the, the things we've had for years and years. Um, it, it's all just even. Citizens and non-citizens, you know, all the same thing. There's no difference between the two. And it comes down to faith. All faiths will get you to heaven. Doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or, or Buddha or Hindu or what. You, you love God. We all worship the same God, right? Wrong. Wrong. But that's what they say. Because Christianity, they say, but we find that Jesus Christ says, Christianity, Jesus Christ himself says you must be what? Born again. It doesn't matter what faith you label yourselves. You're not going to heaven until you get born again. In John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me, but through me. The world isn't like that. Why do you have it and I don't? 
Well, because you're not willing to accept what Jesus Christ has offered you. And if you're here today and have not accepted what Jesus Christ has to offer you in salvation, then you don't understand. And, and what's another interesting thing is I'm told that many people in our evangelical churches today believe there's many ways to get to heaven. Now, they won't tell you that. But if you ask them, are the Buddhists going to heaven? Are the Taoists going to heaven? They have a hard time saying no. You know, they say, well, you know, they're trying to do what's right, you know. That's not what we believe. That's not what Jesus taught. Either you believe what Jesus taught or you don't. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then that means people who have not been born again are going to hell, separated from God for eternity. And it says we need to do as best we can in order to send missionaries out. And when you go to society and look at that nice neighbor that lives next to you, and you haven't talked to them about the Lord, and they're just a nice neighbor, they're good and everything else. They don't go to church any place, and as far as you know, they've never had any idea about God. They're not going to heaven until they get born again. I went for this uh, finger, which finger was it? There's the crooked one, for therapy, you know? I, I talked to the young girl that was sitting behind the desk one day. I was flabbergasted. She must have been 25 years old. That was not flabbergasted me. <laughs> I said, I, somehow I, I talked about church, it was coming to Easter or something, she had never once been inside a church building. It was here in Yardley. Lives right here in our area. I'd never, never been. I said, I, you know, church can, can help you. Well, I don't know how it can help me. I've never been in a church. What's a church do? Completely total absence of knowledge. If you really believe you must be born again, we must do something about it. There's a high school uh, pin they used to have. It said, uh, born once, die twice, born twice, die once. High BA stand for high school born againers. That was the club I was part of. And it was so important. We need to keep them do that and follow that through. I've got an illustration here. Let me just, let me just run this through so you can understand this because I think this is so key and so important. I can't see that clock up there anymore. It's kind of shiny. Um, born once, die twice, born twice, die once. Do you know? What, easy, right? You can remember that. Okay, first slide. The first birth gives us the first death. If you're born, you're gonna die, right? Physical death, that came from Adam and Eve. But when Adam and Eve sinned, we also die spiritually. They died spiritually, and sp death is separation. So physical death is separation of body and soul. Spiritual death is separation from us, from God. So everyone that's born physically has a first birth, is gonna die physically, and die spiritually both. Next slide. The second birth cancels out the second death. Jess, I was going to call you this week and see if you could figure this out and show me some sort of a math equation to do this. I just, there's got to be a better way, but this is the best I could come up with, though. You come up with something better, you let me know, but I don't want to put you that. I, I was going to thought, Monday, I got to call her and say, can you find me an equation to show this better? And this is the best I came up with, you know. Born once, die twice, born twice, die once. I don't know how you equal that or don't equal that or whatever. But uh, the second birth cancels out the second death. So if you have a second birth, the only death you're gonna experience is the first death, the physical death, because there is no spirit, there is no second death. Next. Basically, we're talking the first birth is a physical birth, the second birth is a spiritual birth. The first death is a physical death, the second death is a spiritual death. So the spiritual birth cancels out the spiritual death, which, next, is eternal life. Okay, so physical birth, physical death, and spiritual death. Spiritual birth cancels out the second death, which gives us eternal life. Do you understand that? Raise your hand if you understand that. Okay, if you don't understand that, you need to understand this concept. Because if you're not born again, if you don't understand this concept, if you do not have the second spiritual birth, you're going to have a second, you're already spiritually dead, separated from God, and you will remain that way for eternity because you've never accepted Jesus Christ's spiritual second birth to make you into a new creature. And you will be lost for eternity. And you don't get any more chances after death. The Mormons try to, you know, say, well, I'm going to be baptized for my dead ancestors to try to, you know, um, uh, bring them to God. Well, you, you don't get a second chance. You get a second chance in this life as long as you're alive. 
but you can't guarantee that tomorrow's going to be here. That first song was so important. I, you know, you, uh, uh, Josh, that, that, that first song is one that was so important to us as a family when Jonathan had his accident. You know, it says, you give and take away. Boy, I'll tell you, we couldn't sing that for years, and I bet my wife's going to have a hard time on the second service singing that song. You know? We dropped him off at school one day and had a big hug, and he was excited to be an RA at, at, at Cedarville University. He was going to have the blast his last year. And I, I, he just, he, it hurt Lois, you know. Here's a kid who doesn't want to stay home, wants to go back to college, you know. Um, two days later, we were sitting beside him in a bed in a coma. You never know. Don't think I can do it when I get old, or I can do it next week. I'm not trying to pressure you. I'm just saying, understand the reality of life. The fourth thing he says here, Jesus says, you can't see the wind, but you can, and you can't see the spirit. People say, well, show it to me. Prove it to me, okay? And so he goes in verse, in verse 8. He says, you, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. So it's not going to be like, you know, I got born of the spirit, and now I'm going to have a different face. Or, I mean, yeah, you should live differently, and it's going to maybe, maybe going to smile more and often, but it's not something you can see. Now, it's interesting because the word for spirit here is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, which is related to a disease we get when we have pneumonia, okay? Can't breathe. The word spirit, can, or the word pneuma can be translated spirit, breath, wind. It means the same thing. They can be translated any way depending on the context. So it's kind of a play on words when you say the spirit and wind, okay? As we look at this. So... Um, if you go to the next slide there, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a sandstorm in Kuwait that I personally experienced. That was my picture. I took that, okay? Now, can you see the wind? No. But you can see the evidence of the wind because the sand's in it. I remember one day I was out with the military, and, and a, wind, a wind came along and blew my cover off, my hat off, and it's there. So I go to chase. I go to get it. Well, it starts moving, and, it got, and, and I couldn't see it. But here's this little whirlwind going around. And the only reason the new world is going, because there's my hat going, shh, shh, shh. And I'm, I'm like a, a madman trying to chase this thing around in circles. And there's a little bit of dust in so you can see it. It was just an amazing sight. I had a, I had a mini tornado standing right in front of me, you know? That's the wind. The wind can be powerful. We can't see the wind, but we can see the results of the wind. He's trying to say the same thing as truth of spirit. Go next slide. Here's another picture. Um, our, our military unit, the... Uh, um, the uh, striker brigade was, was um, taken down for six weeks to Hurricane uh, Katrina. <laughs> While we were down there, Hurricane Rita hit. And we sat out Hurricane Rita in our tents and wherever we were. And this is a picture I took outside. You can see the flag that we had, the American flag. They're just practically being blown off the, the pole. And, I mean, it was tremendous wind and rain. What are the results of this kind of thing? Well, when I was there for Hurricane Katrina for those six weeks, I took some pictures. If you've never been to a hurricane uh, site, it's phenomenal. Take next slide. Here's the results of wind. You can't see the wind, but you can see the results. On the top left-hand side, nothing around it, everything going from the inside, just, it just kind of wiped out, and that building happened to remain standing. On the right, you see the tree. I had another picture. I, sh I chose this one instead. <laughs> you can see the tree going on and just crushed the house. That's the wind. <laughs> this other picture I had, had had the house sitting like this. It was a perfect house, and it was sliced straight down the middle by a tree. The tree must hit right between the two rafters, you know, the thing, and went shoo, straight on down. Here's another picture. There's me on the left. You can't see me very well there, but um, that's me standing beside a sign. This is 304 ABCD. There was a four-unit building standing at that site, and they marked it by there's the, the number of the street and the four buildings. Everything's gone. Just wiped out all those left cardboard. And on the right is another house. And all on pylons, part of it left standing, everything else just blown away. You cannot see the wind, but you can see the results. You cannot see the spirit, but you can see the results. He's trying to emphasize that if you're born of the spirit, you can see the results, but you can't see the spirit. If you've had Jesus Christ come into your heart, he's regenerated you, made you born again, we should be able to see the results, but nobody will be able to see the spirit. Oh, there he comes. He's going he's to come right down here now. Now come, come right down in you. You get the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. 
Regeneration, that's what he does. He regenerates us, makes us into a new person. And then he's trying to tell Nicodemus, you can't see it, so I can't prove it to you, but it's just like the wind, which you can't see. This prompts Nicodemus to ask his third question. Verse nine, interesting, it's a short question. How can these things be? <laughs> Still doesn't understand. Uh, Christ gives him two replies, and the first reply is in verses 10 through 13, which is the few verses we're gonna do right now. The second reply starts in verses 14 to 21, which Pastor Ed's gonna handle next week. Very important that you understand those verses, but these verses are the lead-in. Jesus says, and his, his, interest is a mild, his, his answer is a mild rebuke. Are you a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand? You know, you're the guy with the master divinity degree. You're the one that's the head. I mean, there's only 70 of you that are running this whole place. And you don't know the answer? You don't understand what I'm saying? That's not good. The second thing he responds with, as we look, this is in verses 11 and 12, and he starts an explanation here. But the fact that, that Nicodemus could not understand, let me take you back to a verse in Matthew. It says this. He says, let the little children come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. You see, sometimes, we're, have you ever heard this expression, you're too smart for your own britches? Anybody ever heard that? I think my mom used to say that sometimes. Hopefully not to me. <laughs> you know, too smart for your own britches. That's what happens. We get overeducated. You teach in a college, you know? And sometimes they're the worst ones to try to convince because they're so overeducated. They think they know everything, you know? And they gotta throw out all that junk and just start off with a think, it's salvation by faith. Jesus Christ died on the cross for me, I'm a sinner, end of story. But they get into all this other stuff and Confucius and Hinduism and Muslims and everything else and they, they, try, to, they try to psychoanalyze the scriptures. Jesus says, you're not gonna see it. The wind and spirit you don't see. It takes faith. And so he comes here, and we have to recognize that the spiritual birth is un incomprehensible to typical men. It says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the preaching of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. It's like, you know, you won't know the power, you won't know what it's like until you accept it. They say, well, I want to know it beforehand. Well, you can't. It's an experience you can't have first. And so Jesus Christ goes on in verses 11 through, and through 13 and says two things. Verse 11, he says again, here's this truly, truly, his third truly, truly. I say to you, and the you there is plural. So he's not just talking to Nicodemus, he's talking to you and you types, all the other Pharisees, anybody else who will listen to you. I talk to you, we, now who's we? Something could be we, referring to we and the, me and the disciples, but some think it might be for we, the Godhead, God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We, we speak that which we know, because we are God. I mean, the disciples didn't even know he was Jesus Christ hardly at this point. They, they had very basic loving, so I don't think they're witnessing very much. And we bear witness that, that of that which we have seen and you do not receive our witness. Jesus Christ was right there. He, was in, he, he went to the temple, he cleansed the temple. They didn't receive him. Nicodemus showed up, at least he's asking questions. And we'll find out when you get to chapter seven and to with crucifixion that Nicodemus became a true convert, I believe. But at this point, he's just learning. And verse 12, it says, if I tell you, told you earthly things and you do not believe, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? I'm telling you about earthly stuff here. If I start going into spiritual, deeper stuff, you're really gonna be, have your mind blown. I'm just trying to give you some, inter some the basic facts, just the facts. Verse 13, and no one has ascended into heaven, but he who has descended from heaven, even the Son of Man. So no one can go to heaven and talk to God and figure this stuff out. You can't see it, you know? But since you won't be able to get to heaven, I who live in heaven came down to see you. And as it says in John 1, 14, God became flesh. Put on human body. And there's that word flesh again referring to physical. Became physical so that you could see him. That's why I came. Verse 14 and following next week, gonna be, I'm gonna, uh, Pastor Ed's gonna do a great job in verses 14 through 21 
Um, but as we look at this section, I want to end it with the same thing that I said before, and this is the theme today. Say it with me, if you will. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. The first death, the first birth has two deaths. The second birth cancels out the second death and gives us eternal life. Today, if you come to, the, if you come to this church for years, uh, you know, I don't know how long it's been. You could have been acting like a Christian for all this time. Nobody ever knows. We don't know all the backgrounds of everybody. I've had people that have gone through, they've been kids, they come up to 18, 20 years of age and say, you know what? I've always been going to my parents' faith. I really never made a decision myself. Today's got to be that day. And if it isn't next week when we get to John uh, chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Let's all bow our heads in for just a, few, a moment. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, today is the day you should do that. You need to recognize that death, spiritual death, separates you from God for eternity, and it took place the day you were born. That death can get canceled out so you spend eternity with God by accepting Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross and having a spiritual birth which cancels out that death. I'm not going to have you walk down the aisle or anything here, but I know most of the people here. And I'm going to ask you, if, if, if you want to make this decision today, you've either never made it before or you can't remember when you made it and you say, I want to, I want to nail this down, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And if nobody raised their hands, that's fine. Come talk to me sometime else. And I will encourage you to get baptized, to publicly declare that. Maybe you come to the point where you say, I know I'm saved, I know I believe this, but I've never really publicly declared that, and I, and I probably should do that, because that was the Bible Scriptures telling me to do. And if you want to do it and publicly declare it in the waters of baptism, let me know that also. But if you want to just privately communicate with me quickly here, if you want to pray this prayer and make sure of heaven, raise your hand right now. Whether you raise your hand or not, I'm still going to pray this prayer. Repeat after me if you want to. If you want to understand, and it doesn't be this. This is no magical words. I'm just going to say it. But if you want, this is the kind of thing you should pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner, and I deserve hell because my sin would corrupt heaven. I also know that Jesus Christ died on the cross, being perfect and pay the penalty for my sin. You come into my life, take away my sin, and make me one of your children today. And just end it with amen. Dear Lord, I don't know if anybody is in this point. I'm, I'm hoping that every single person in this church, and I believe they may be, knows you as their personal Savior. If there's anyone that does not, have them think on this and come to know you as their personal Savior today or without very much delay. But help us who, are, who do know you as Jesus Christ to recognize that everyone we know who has not been born again is not going to heaven. They're going to hell, and that's hard to hear. Help encourage us to share this message with them. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. In Jesus' name, amen.